Hello, and uh, welcome to the primer for the age of polygenic screening, present and future, or the digitalization and commercialization of identity. Um, so I'm just going to give you a little overview of polygenic screening. Um, this uh, polygenic screening is a new technique that basically started in earnest um, two or three years ago, and there's been surprisingly little kind of discussion about it, so yeah, just to give you a bit of uh, background. Uh, introduction. Polygenic screening takes place within the context of um, in vitro fertilization, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of details about that. So IVF, um, the process, you basically start with some tests. You do ovarian simulation, egg retrieval, sperm retrieval. So you get some eggs and some sperm. You put them together. You have fertilization. Um, you have an embryo. And then uh, you do some screening, and then you transfer the embryo into a womb. So this is the kind of um, basic setup. Um, within the IVF process, polygenic screening happens here. Um, like, there is already screening happening in, within regular IVF, but normally you're just screening for um, monogenic traits, um, but I'll, I'll get into this in a minute. Um, the, uh, this polygenic screening part, is, it's worth noting that it's a very small intervention in a sense. Um, technically, you know, the, the IVF process is a medical procedure that is kind of um, expensive and complicated, and within this, polygenic screening is a very sort of, um, it's a very, you know, technically quite small and, and, and um, easy. Um, what you do to do polygenic screening and other forms of um, uh, screening is um, you take an embryo, which in the very early stages is something like 10 or 20 cells, and you extract one of the cells, and you um, DNA, do DNA sequencing on this cell, and then you um, you, you get a score for the cell of, uh, yeah, which I'll get into this in a bit more detail. Um, within the context of this conference, bits and cash, polygenic screening um, should be thought of as a digital good. You know, it, it is a digital good. Um, and this is sort of very important when you think about the um, legislation and so forth. Um, and just to give you a bit of context, maybe you've heard about things like 23andMe, Ancestry.com, DNA Test 24. So these are services which you send them um, a vial containing some of your DNA, and they will give you a score um, regarding your certain health indicators, and um, they will tell you some things about your ancestry. Uh, the two uh, companies on the right, Veritas and Dante Labs, they offer um, whole genome sequencing. So the ones on the, on the left cost about $100, and they just give you a sort of range of, of information where the ones on the right um, cost about $500, and they give you your entire genome. Uh, I'm not sponsored by any of these people, and I haven't used any of these services myself. Um, but if I was going to use one of them, I would choose the whole genome sequencing. Because if you have your entire genome, um, this is a, is a, um, a piece of you know, it's a 100 gigabytes of data, which gets better and more useful with time as the general data sets get better. So you can query it again and again. Whereas if you just use one of these, um, the, what they tell you is sort of very limited at the current state of knowledge. Um, and um, yeah, it's all about the data set. Polygenic screening is a, is a big data phenomenon. The only reason we're having this conversation is because of this graph. Um, basically, when, um, when uh, the Human Genome Project was completed 23 years ago, um, there was this great hope that we would discover um, the gene for you know, this and this and this, that there would be a gene for everything, every trait that you might want to have some impact on. Um, unfortunately, this you know, wasn't the case, and there was a sort of winter where people were, um, uh, yeah, realized that um, genetics was very complicated, um, and there wasn't going to be a gene for this and this and this. There's no, there's no gene for very specific things, like musical ability or whatever. Um, but uh, the cost of, of sequencing went down, and then in 2007, it really dropped off a cliff. And now we're in this realm where sequencing is really incredibly cheap. Um, you can get your, yeah, as I said, um, commercially, you can get it done for $500. Um, in labs, it's more like $100 per person to get your entire genome sequenced. Um, so starting at around 2016, after a few years of this being in this regime, we um, yeah, found ourselves in a state where we had really enormous data sets, and with enormous data sets, it became possible to do th this kind of um, statistical analysis, which makes polygenic screening possible. 
Um, just one example of a, one of the data sets that's available. Um, this is not the only one, but it's one of the ones that's most widely used in academia, the UK Biobank. It's um, 500,000 uh, British people, and it combines genetic data with um, census data, and they also do sort of life um, uh, questionnaires, and um, they look at their kind of life. Um, yeah, there's several other data sets, but this is one of the most widely used. So coming back to this, um, obviously, yeah, as I said, IVF is a, is a complex medical process. Um, but if you're getting IVF done anyway, polygenic screening is a very small and simple intervention. And it, it's worth bearing in mind that it's a, a digital technology, and, it sh and you should think about it as a digital te technology. And it comes with all of these sort of benefits and um, drawbacks of, of a digital te technology. So let's just do a shallow dive on polygenic screening itself to give you a sort of idea of what it really means. Um, how does it work? You get an enormous number of people. Um, I was reading a paper that came out in 2022 where they used three million people. Um, and if you have a large enough people, it's a very brute force uh, approach. You just um, look at all of their DNA, uh, you look at their character traits, and you compare every single one, and you say, does this piece of DNA contribute to this character trait based on this huge data sample? Um, and you find these correlations. So it's, it's um, not a very difficult to understand. Um, it's, it's very just brute force. You just need very, very large numbers of people, and you get, um, uh, you get um, these correlations between um, yeah, d uh, genomes and character traits. Um, so what do these companies actually offer? So there's the monogenic traits, which are done by default. The, the polygenic screening companies also add these, um, but I'll just yeah, go through these. Um, so these were the, the thing that they hoped they would find many of, where you have a condition that is caused by a gene. And these are quite rare, but they, but they exist. Um, I'm just going to associate each of these with an emoji just to save space. And um, I've also added a sort of radio button here to show that these are binary phenomenon. They're either on or off. So you can screen for these things, um, and it either, you either have it or you don't. Um, and then you have oops, the um, polygenic traits. So this is the sort of regular package that's now available. Um, atrial fibrillation, coronary artery disease, heart attack, breast cancer, prostate cancer, gout, asthma, inflammatory bowel disease. I'm just going to associate these with an emoji to make it a bit easier. Um, so you have a bunch of heart conditions on the left, you have a bunch of cancers in the middle, and then you have a bunch of other stuff on the right. Um, what's worth noting are these three down here, obesity, major depression, and schizophrenia. Because here you can see um, these, these, these characteristics are starting to sort of impinge on the, um, the, the more sort of, the realm that you might think of as character traits or, you know? I mean, nobody wants cancer, but um, it's unclear how, how far this sort of process should go into, you know, character traits and so forth. And um, yeah, these three in particular are sort of um, heading into this territory of like being, you know, they're more complex characteristics that uh, have a lot of other impacts in other, in other parts of people's lives. Um, and these are um, sort of done with these sliders. Um, again, it's not <laughs> quite this simple, but um, just to illustrate the, the ranking. Um, each of the characteristics is sort of um, rated in terms of how much it impacts your quality of life and how much they can sort of um, impact the thing. So, so for, some, for example, some conditions um, with a good polygenic index, you can reduce the risk by 10 or 20 times, whereas with other things, you can only reduce the risk by one or two times. You know? So they, the, the scientists that offer this, they sort of have this um, ranking system that is based on sort of big data. Um, and the, the reason also you need these, um, these sort of this ranking is because there, there, are, um, th there is the possibility of trade-offs between characteristics. So sometimes you may find that some of these um, sliders are essentially coupled, such that if you pull one, you will pull another. Um, so, so you have the sort of polygenic traits on the right, and the uh, monogenic traits on the left, which are just basically binary. Um, going on to the uh, legislation and price, 
Um, so, Life View uh, from Genomic Prediction, uh, working in 173 clinics in 37 countries and six continents, and growing rapidly. As I said, this is you know um, this is a emerging technology. It's um, very new, and um, yeah, it's it's sort of um, yeah, rapidly growing. Legal in 30 out of 43 countries in Europe. This paper that I read this in was um, now three years old, so I expect this to have changed a little bit, but just to give you an idea. Over a million babies are born each year via IVF. 10% of children in Denmark, for example, are born via IVF, and Denmark and Israel pay for IVF. This question of whether you have sort of financial support from the government is obviously very important. Um, and uh, just to clarify again, the sort of conflation between IVF and polygenic screening, um, actually, if I, the next slide, you have the price. So this is the price for IVF. And um, if you're lucky enough to live in a country where this is paid for, you don't need to, to worry about this, but um, uh, the, the, the cost of IVF is something like maybe up to um, 10, 10 or 15,000 um, dollars, depending on where you are. And then on top of that, the polygenic screening is maybe three to five thousand dollars. So the polygenic screening is here. Um, it depends on how many embryos you want to select on. Um, and the rest, yeah. Basically, if you are already getting IVF, which a lot of people, 10% like of people already are, then um, getting polygenic screening on top of that costs something in the order of maybe $5,000. Um, if you aren't getting IVF, you can choose to go through this process. If you want to get polygenic, if you want to do polygenic screening, um, you have to do IVF to do that, and then, you, and then it's more expensive. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, and going back to the legality, um, you see, as I mentioned with these um, traits in the right, sort of um, depression and, and schizophrenia, um, you could also have other traits uh, which are currently illegal to, to add. So this would be, maybe be height. They've demonstrated that they can control this. This might be muscle density. Maybe this would be happiness. Um, or this would be musical ability. And um, these characteristics are currently illegal in most places. Um, you can't um, select on these things. It, they have to be medically necessary. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, the, the nature of polygenic screening as the digital good means that you have this um, difficulty of, of kind of uh, stopping people from, from doing this. You know, it, it, you should think about it on the level of being an email exchange, because it, it is essentially an email exchange. You, 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 the um, embryo is being biopsied anyway for regular screening, and you just send the, um, the, the, the biopsy results to some company online. It's a super official polygenic screening at company, um, and there's nothing stopping people from CCing this email to black market musician makers at proton.mail or black market character generator at tor.mail, the, the, the fact that it's a digi digital technology comes with these difficulties of sort of blocking it, you know? Um, obviously, there's legislation in place, um, but uh, yeah, it, it is essentially on the level of an email exchange, um, and there are already black, market, um, black markets in sort of other characteristics that you're not no normally meant to be selecting on. Um, a little bit of opinion here. Um, there's a, yeah, often when people talk about this, they think um, their immediate, immediate response is to get more, um, more legislation. Um, uh, unfortunately, we've seen with IVF that um, in Germany, for example, uh, it was illegal for homosexual couples, for single women, to do IVF for a very long time. Um, and it, it seems to me like, uh, basically, when you have um, um, legislation of this kind, you always end up with one thing. You always end up with standardization. And in the case of Germany, if you have a government-approved version of polygenic screening that is given to government-approved people, that's only going to go one way. Um, whereas I think this is a case where um, anarchy is clearly the, uh, the um, or, or um, deregulation. Deregulation can lead to diversity. People can choose um, variety. And yeah, I just worry that um, if people choose to regulate this as much as they can, they will standardize things as much as they can, and this is what you'll get. But anyway, that's just a very brief opinion part. I tried to keep this as free from opinions as possible. Um, mostly, I'm just intending to, to sort of, uh, yeah, allow you to form your own opinions. Um, does it work? <clears throat> so, as it is now, you get moderate improvements. 
something like five disability adjusted life years. So obviously, um, yeah, that's, uh, it's not insignificant. Um, you know, if, if, yeah, if, if you were already getting an IVF and this cost 5,000 bucks, 1,000 bucks per year is quite a, quite a reasonable expense. Um, it's very much limited by the data. This means a lot of different things. One thing it does mean in particular is that the, the, the current um, offerings are much better for European um, people with European ancestry than others because of, as I mentioned, the UK Biobank, for example, is one of the big data sets. So they have information. A lot of the best information comes from British people, so British people get the best results. Um, it's, it's very easy and relatively cheap to expand the data sets to more of the world population, and is also happening. Um, as I said, the cost of doing genome sequencing is very cheap, so uh, yeah, the, the, the data is getting very much better very quickly. It's limited by the genetics of the parents. So if I have a, want to have a child with somebody, um, I, the child can't have character traits that are not possible for my children to have. Um, you know, uh, it's kind of an obvious statement, and, and, and you know, what is, what is possible within you know, a person's genetics is, is quite a lot, but there are limits, and it's limited by the genetic, genetics of the parents. Um, you may say, oh, sorry, you may say that um, four or five disability-adjusted life years doesn't seem like a big deal. Um, first, the, the differences will accumulate over time, and, and these techniques will get better over time. Um, as it is, it's pretty much confined to elites, so the status quo is elites get a marginal but consistent improvement every generation. So let's talk about the future and how we might um, work on democratizing this technology. Um, extrapolating the disability adjusted life year gain versus health index score curve to the entire human population results in something like 30 or 40 dallies more than the average, or something like 120 total years of life. So this is uh, what they expect, um, and this actually matches up with a lot of other predictions about um, sort of human longevity, which is that yeah, 120 years of healthy lifespan looks like something like the limit. Um, what to do if you want to overcome the limitations of the techniques? <clears throat> so in order to investigate this and to try to look at, um, to, to try to get some realistic images of the future, I uh, did a, a bit of a, a, a deep dive into the um, animal breeding literature, basically to, to look at the techniques that are being used in other mammals. Um, so they, they have this technique called in vitro, in vitro embryo production. It's very much the same as IVF. It's just a sort of industrialized version of this, which they do to, yeah, which they um, have made a lot cheaper and more effective. Um, close to one million cows per year are produced in this way. It is currently the most common method of embryo production in cows, as in it is the most common method of cow production of any sort. So there, there are more cows produced um, via IVEP than by any other method. Um, you can do germline editing. Obviously, this is a big no-no in Germany and most of Europe. Um, uh, but there are, are already CRISPR cows, pigs, sheep, goats, rabbits, chickens, and fish in the world. Um, germline editing is, is very expensive and difficult, and the technology isn't really sort of, um, it's not really mature yet in a way. Um, so to, to make it a, a, um, economically effective, they um, use it to create breed stocks for IVEP. So they will genetically engineer an animal, and then they, um, then they uh, breed this animal, and they produce a, a huge number of animals from this animal. So this makes it more cost effective. And then cloning, widely used in livestock, horses, dogs, and cats, commercialized in several industries. Um, but with cloning and germline editing, um, it's, uh, even though it is done, and you can, for example, get your dog or your cat cloned for about $50,000, um, these techniques are still um, very expensive and not very good. So um, industrial techniques can help make the process cheaper, but absent significant breakthroughs in the science, cloning and germline editing will likely not play a significant role in the near future in humans. They're just um, not very good techniques, aside from all of the ethical problems. Um, so how can we make it cheaper and more democratic? apart from the data. So the data is something that is happening, and more data will always make this technique better. And I'm, so I'm just going to go briefly into a few um, things which are still in the research phase at the moment. So one is egg parthenogenesis. Um, this is yeah, one of many potential ways of 
producing more eggs because the, 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 quali the quality of the screening is very much limited at the moment by the number of eggs that you can, um, and the number of embryos you can produce. So in egg parthenogenesis, you get the uh, sperm and the egg, you put them together, the, um, uh, the egg then thinks it is an embryo essentially, and will start um, um, splitting. But before it can start splitting, you pull the, um, the sperm uh, out, and so you have a, an egg which thinks it's an embryo, which starts to reproduce, um, but which only has the female um, genes. Um, so in this way, you can, yeah, you can produce um, a lot of eggs. Um, you can also do group, group chromosome selection, which um, in some ways sounds similar to sort of germline editing, but um, it's uh, a lot uh, sort of safer and doesn't involve actually directly modifying the genes themselves. And basically what you do is you, you can um, get a, a group of people, maybe you get 10 people or so, and you collect your, your chromosomes together and you can recombine them in certain ways. Um, and so this is a graph of the number of full genomes and the Oh, sorry, sorry, number of standard deviations um, of improvement on some trait versus the number of full genomes. So if you have like, if you only have one genome, you can um, get like one standard deviation improvement on, a, on some character trait. If you have 10 genomes, you can get way more, you can get like six. Um, so this is a really significant boost. And um, yeah, um, so group chromosome selection is one of the ways that you can overcome the limits of your own genetics um, the the, the big, big problem with this is that, um, you know, depending on the number of people that you do this with, um, the um, child that is born may look more unfamiliar to you than, than, a, than a child born in the normal way. So the, the more you, the, the larger the changes you get, um, the, uh, the yeah, more unlike the original, uh, and the larger the group of people you use for something like this, the more unlike any one person the child would be. So maybe people mind about that. Um, and finally, uh, you have iterated embryo selection. I had to piece this image together from some other images because um, there isn't actually, uh, a, this hasn't been published yet anywhere. It's just sort of um, an idea that's thrown around in these circles. Um, but basically, you, you do the regular thing. You, you do take an embryo biopsy, you do a genetic analysis, um, you uh, do embryo selection. And then from these embryos, you can actually uh, take the inner mast cells and um, and turn them back into pluripotent cells, and then create primordial germ cells, sperm and eggs, and then you can uh, loop this back um, into a new set of embryos. And you can do this um, many different times um, for many generations in, in vitro. Um, and in this way, you can get the sort of, A, you can, it's sort of a combination of the last two techniques. Um, you can get the maximum possible gains for any character trait. And um, you can also uh, combine a lot of different um, people's uh, um, genetics in this way. So yeah, these are some um, ideas that are sort of um, people are working on. Uh, so to wrap up, polygenic screening is here. Um, currently, you can get five disability adjusted life years for five thousand dollars, and of course, this. I mean, in a lot of countries, it's paid for by your um, by your health insurance. So this is just to give you an idea if you wanted to do it. I don't know. Um, the data is improving rapidly. So you know, the, the, the gain you can get is only going to go up. The remaining limits are cost, egg production, and genetic basis. Cost is being driven down with industrial techniques. Techniques for egg production are improving. Techniques for boosting the genetic basis for selection are improving. Um, thank you, and uh, any questions? Uh, yeah, there's a microphone here, I think, or there. Hello. Hello. Thanks. That was a very interesting topic. Um, that last slide you showed with the iterative process, mm -hmm. how many times could it be repeated before things go really wrong? Um, so as I said, this is still in the research phase, so um, we can't even do this like once now. Um, but uh, all of the parts are, are being worked on, and. Um, yeah, it's, it's sort of the same as the story with the um, cloning. Um, you know, the, the idea is that once, the, like once they manage to get this process to work, um, there shouldn't be any limit to how many times you can do it. But obviously, the, the, the more you do it, the, the more um, number of cycles you, you do of this process, the further the um, eventual embryo will be from the original 
um, genetics of the, of the original people. Uh, and slightly related, where is this being worked on? United States, Europe? Um, I'm, yeah, I think mostly the United States. I, I, I read a lot of <laughs> research papers for this talk, but I didn't pay much attention to where they were based, partially because, um, because of the nature of this technology as a digital good. Uh, I mean, iterated embryo selection is not a digital good, but polygenic screening is a digital good, so I figured it didn't really matter where, where it was being done. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah? Uh, maybe. How do you convert uh, from pluripotent cells to, to germline? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's, yeah. definitely, it's definitely complicated, but uh, um, yeah, I can. There is, um, there is a bibliography here, which is kind of long. Um, but if you want to look through some of these papers, maybe you could find the answer. <laughs> sure thing. And the, the, the talk is actually um, just on uh, my personal website. So if you did want to, these are all links. So if you want to go to, the, to there and, um, and click on some of these, yeah, maybe the, maybe the answer is in there. Thank you. Anything else? Well, thank you. <laughs>